The Chaser Report is recorded on Gadigal land. Striving for mediocrity in a world of excellence, this is The Chaser Report. Hello and welcome to The Chaser Report. Dom here. Without Charles, he's still working on his forthcoming TV show, Optics. But we have, once again, Dr. Emma Shortus, Senior Researcher in the International and Security Affairs Program at the Australia Institute. Emma, welcome back. Thanks for having me back. It's good to be here. There's been a new uh, Democratic presidential, uh, not quite presumptive nominee, people have pointed out, but a presumptive, presumptive nominee, mm-hmm. shall we say. Kamala Harris, the vice president, has uh, swept uh, Joe Biden aside, in a sense. He got out of the way in the end. And let's talk about who she is, what it all means, and really how the Republicans are uh, responding to this sudden mm-hmm. personal change in just a moment here on the podcast. Right. So Joe went on Sunday. What did you think when the news came through? I I feel like um, I keep saying um, that American politics is shocking, but not surprising. You know, I think we all expected that Biden probably wasn't going to survive that weekend, but it was still, it was still a shock, you know, to wake up in Australia at least and, and see that news, you know, it did, it did feel like once he'd made the decision, it happened really quickly and then, of course, he endorsed Harris super quickly and all of a sudden within kind of 24 hours she was, I think, you know, you described her as the presumptive nominee and I think that's accurate. You know, it was only within a couple of days that American outlets were reporting that she'd secured enough delegates, you know, enough delegates had said that they would vote for her, um, that she had the nomination stitched up. And and I don't think anybody thought that would happen quite so quickly. You know, there'd been so much wariness around Harris and her ability to campaign, which at least partly explained, I think, why Biden took so long to step aside. So so the fact that she does have it stitched up so quickly is, um, yeah, again, I know, kind of surprising. <laughs> no serious contender put their hat in the ring. Marianne Williamson, is her name, um, sure. I think, is interested in the position as ever, but... Um, no, it does seem as though this all happened very quickly. There was a concern that if it did happen this quickly, it might seem a bit undemocratic, but really it seems to be a ringing endorsement. And it's really as though an adrenaline shot has been uh, given to the Democratic Party as a result. They're all really running around like Joe Biden at the State of the Union. Suddenly, <laughs> I was it jacked up Joe, didn't they call him in the GOP? They did, yeah. It was one of the better nicknames, I think. And um, I think that's a really good description. Like there seems to be this energy all of a sudden infusing the Democratic Party um, that kind of appeared so quickly. You know, Harris seems to have really energised people. You know, she raised an extraordinary amount of money just in the first 24 hours. It was more than $80 million and had a list of endorsements from, you know, Congress people to, to unions, the Black Congressional Caucus. The list is is super long. And, and you're right that no serious contender looks like they will challenge her. All of the names that were coming up, you know, Gretchen Whitmer, Gavin Newsom, they've all endorsed her. So for them to turn around and um, challenge her for the nomination would be pretty surprising, I think, at this stage. But it's been, um, it's been quite the experience. Like some of it almost feels a bit like 2008 Obama nostalgia e like the kind of romance that swept through at least part of you know a segment I suppose of American politics has been um really quite something to watch. Yeah, and it's not every time you know you get to elect a first. And Kamala mm. Harris has been several first things so far in her career. Hillary Clinton came out with an op-ed in the New York Times, which I'm sure she was just itching to write, <laughs> reminding us all that she almost got there and won the popular vote. But also pointing out this this even though the circumstances in which it's all come about are. are unique and complex and a bit awkward for Joe Biden, really. Mm. This will be an extraordinary moment, really, um, for America. It'll be uh, in the list of of presidents for as long as there are presidents. Kamala Harris's name will will have an asterisk next to it as the first woman and a woman of colour at that. A a term which, by the way, has been quite contested in Australia in the past few weeks, but it's a term she uses about herself. And it is meaningful that she has um, African-American and also Indian-American heritage. Yeah, I think it's it's really meaningful. You know, I've seen some... um... I suppose, analysis that's talked about her heritage and the fact that, you know, she captioned her autobiography something like an American journey, or I've got that wrong, but it's something quite similar to that. And I think there is this real sense that she kind of embodies that particular story about the particular kind of good story, I suppose, about American multiculturalism and diversity and her campaign and her supporters, I think, are using that, at least for the moment, really effectively as a, a contrast, of course, to the Trump campaign and, and the Trump Vance ticket and it and it energizing supporters, you know, in terms of the enthusiasm, I think, for electing the first 
woman of color as the president of the United States. There's been reports that, you know, in the couple of days after Biden withdrew, there were, you know, Zoom meetings organized to get kind of grassroots um, volunteers mobilized. And one particular meeting of black women voters and volunteers ended up having something like 40,000 plus people sign on to this Zoom meeting, <laughs> which just gives you a kind of indication, I think, of the enthusiasm on the ground for Harris. Like, of course, you know, there are lots of questions about whether that will last, how much of it is kind of manufactured or just, you know, sheer relief at the fact that it's not Biden and Trump. Again, you know, there was such despair, I think, and dis- dissatisfaction in America about that being the choice, that the fact that the choice now appears to be quite radically different in and of itself, I think is super energizing for American politics. Yeah, look, none of the above was appealing to a lot of the electorate for a while there. Mm. <laughs> they now have a new person. And I mean, I have, um, my my in-laws are from the same, um, uh, I guess, South Asian community as Kamala Harris from the, the um, with their roots in Tamil Nadu state in uh, in India. And and as you say, black women uh, have got, gotten out in droves. They're the generally the most loyal demographic mm. segment we always hear for the Democrats. So that we'll see how they go. And I mean, already, I mean, you can see the case for, for change. And I guess Joe Biden in the end was convinced that uh, even if he didn't think it was necessary, um, a shot in the arm and a move to a younger generation was going to be what he had to do. Look, it certainly appears that way, Dom. You know, it, it's difficult, I think, to kind of pass Biden's decision making, but it does seem as though he was convinced, particularly by Pelosi and those arguments about, you know, saving Congress and particularly some opinion polling, some pretty disastrous opinion polling for him in swing states that he won last time around that was suggesting he would lose those states, you know, states he absolutely would need to win to hold on to the presidency. And so it does appear that he's been convinced by that and and does seem now convinced that Harris can do it. You know, he's phoned into one of her first campaign events um, to offer his support. And I think, you know, has really with that speech from the Oval Office, um, which happened this morning as, as we're recording, really has kind of cleared the way for her, you know, to say that he's going to see out the end of his presidency and kind of do that from an almost, uh, you know, aloof sort of statesman-like place and allow her to run that campaign, you know, which is, as you say, like such an incredible contrast to his, which, you know, as from the Oval Office today was kind of sombre and focused very much on the threats to American democracy, which Harris is doing as well. But, you know, doing, I think, from a place of hope and joy, you know, she laughs at things at her campaign events, which is um, maybe a mark of the kind of despair that's that's, um, infected all of American politics. But the fact that she's like laughing and um, kind of leaning into some humour about Trump in particular, you know, and and her contrast to him, I think, as we've discussed, is is such a um, potential energizer for American politics and something that just Biden could could absolutely never have done. Donald Trump has already tried uh, a few nicknames. His first mm-hmm. reaction was Luffin, L A double F I N apostrophe. I don't know he loves the apostrophes, but he does Luffin Kamala as a way of trying to belittle her, really, based on her love of a good laugh. Thing is, though, people who laugh, I. It's actually quite an endearing characteristic. Um, and so that seems to have been abandoned. And he's now stuck with Lion without, again, with the N apostrophe, Lion Kamala seems to be the, the latest one. Um, tell me a bit about, about Kamala Harris, your impressions of her, how she went in California um, when she had a fairly brief stay in the Senate, but mm. also her time as, as vice president. And I guess it's also important to mention, as she has been repeatedly, her time as a prosecutor, which serves up a fairly... Uh, ironic uh, contrast with Donald Trump, given his legal troubles. Yeah. And she's really leaning into that, isn't she? You know, like using those lines about when she was a prosecutor, she she went after sex offenders and fraudsters and felon, felons. And so she knows Donald Trump's type. You know, she's really leaning into that contrast and that record as a prosecutor. I think the thing about Harris is that Americans actually don't know her that well, Dom, you know, as you've described, she kind of was um, attorney general in in California and, of course, was well known there, but not necessarily nationally, and then had a little stint in the Senate and then a run for the no- the nomination, the Democratic nomination in 2020. And she had a few kind of standout moments in that campaign, one in particular where she went out, went after Joe Biden in a debate about his history of working with segregationist senators and some pretty dicey positions that he had on Busing, but she sort of um, 
crashed and burned really. Maybe that's a bit unfair, but but she did crash out of the the nomination process even before the the primaries had begun. Um, and then, of course, was elevated to prominence again when when Biden chose her as his vice president. And she was meant quite clearly that choice was meant as a as a symbol uh, or a, I guess this kind of symbolic fulfillment of of Biden's promise to be a generational bridge for the Democratic Party, you know, for a young and diverse party being led by an old white dude, this was a kind of indication that he was going to to be that bridge. But as vice president, she was very much in, I think, in Biden's shadow, which is really inevitable generally for vice presidents. But there are some pretty strong arguments, I think, that she wasn't, especially initially, treated particularly fairly. Like he gave her ownership of immigration, which is much like it is here, <laughs> always a kind of poison chalice, really. Hospital pass. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but she did, particularly, I think, in the last kind of six months, she has um, gotten stronger, I think, in her performance, particularly as she's been focused on and really owning reproductive rights in the campaign. That's an area where she is really particularly strong. And I think probably part of the calculation amongst many Democrats was that that's going to be a critical mobilizing factor in the election. And, you know, if we go back to Biden's performance, his responses to questions about reproductive rights in the debate were completely disastrous. You know, even those hospital passes that he was given by the moderators, he just couldn't communicate on an an issue that is a critical mobiliser. And that's a real contrast to Harris. So I expect we'll see a lot more of that. And, and, you know, a lot more of that kind of leaning into to fun. She does that quite well, I think. But, you know, she can also be a bit bit weird (laughs) and is also... um, I think on the kind of scale of American left, the left of politics in in the United States is is pretty conservative. You know that's that's why Biden chose her. She's she's not a radical, and so whether that energy um, is maintained, especially on the on the left of the party, is is still an open question. I think. Yeah. So we still have much to learn about Kamala Harris. Mm-hmm. I feel, but it is hard not to remember the Obama energy and the people in stadiums to hear him speak. Um, and Donald Trump clearly generates that same excitement and a movement on the right. We'll see what Harris does in terms of rallies around the country. But mm. it does feel, yes, as though there's actually suddenly a wave of enthusiasm that has been unleashed that simply isn't possible for someone we knew as well as as Joe Biden and the, the electorate knew as well as, as Joe Biden. So Kamala Harris has a lot to do. What are the early signs in terms of polls? I, I certainly have seen a few pollsters being quite guarded in their response thus far. But the real argument... I guess that was put to Biden was that the party not only couldn't win with him as the candidate, but would um, do terrible things to mm. its chances in both the House and the Senate, bearing in mind that if Donald Trump is president and they want to try and stop him unleashing the Project 25 agenda that we talked about last time we, we chatted, Emma, um, they will need to try and block him. They can't do that if they lose the House and the yep. Senate. So that's the argument. How's it looking? Um, I think, I mean... I'm I'm taking the easy way out, but I think it's too early to tell. You're yeah. right that there have been some polls out which haven't shifted heaps. Like, correct me if I'm wrong, but the ones that I've seen, especially the national polls, I think still have Trump marginally ahead. Mm. But I think it's going to take polling a while to catch up. Like, uh, you know, so much has happened in the past few weeks, and I think people are still processing it. We've had the assassination attempt, of course, the the kind of chaos around Biden and then his withdrawal and and Harris's, um, you know, kind of as, almost immediate ascension to presumptive nominee. So I think it will take polls a, a while to to catch up. I, I have seen some um, quite interesting analysis on of states like. Georgia, which will also be a critical, we expect, I think will be a critical um, swing state. You know, the the Senate race there went to a runoff last time around. So we're we're talking really, really slim margins. And I think the potential for Harris to be a mobiliser in a state like Georgia, which has a significant African-American population, of course, and pretty pretty impressive ground game and organising on the part of the Democrats led by Stacey Abrams. You know, I I think it's likely that Harris could perform really, really strongly in a state like Georgia where, you know, I think people, people are sick of Trump in much the way we were discussing before that, you know, people are sick of both Biden and Trump. They don't want either of them. And so again, having that choice, you know, potentially energizes voters. I think what, what will be really clear indication of what the polling is doing is who Harris picks as her vice president that, that will kind of tell us where they think they need to, um, 
focus on, you know, which states they need to focus on, which voter demographics they need to focus on. So, you know, there's a reason I think there's been so much speculation about how she, who she's going to pick. Yeah, it's interesting to to think back to on the role that Joe Biden had in the Obama administration. And when uh, Obama picked Biden, it was clear that the message was, I'm the exciting person on this ticket. Uh, I'm choosing Biden to overcome any perception that I don't know what I'm doing and that we have a, a, an experienced head when it comes to things like foreign policy. And my impression of that administration was that Biden was far more central to it, even though Obama overruled him on things. He was always in the room and always, um, I, I think Obama described him as the last person he spoke to on major mm. decisions and so on. I didn't get, didn't get the sense that Kamala Harris had that elevated position in the Biden administration really much at all. She was given a couple of projects to do, some of which were, were difficult, as you've been saying, Emma. So in terms of picking a partner, it's not just about who can give you votes you might need. It's, mm -hmm. it's about, about potentially a strong governing partner. Goodness knows, in the case of Dick Cheney, someone who seemed to be running much of the federal government <laughs> during George W. Bush's time in the Oval Office, but also your successor, as we've seen here, mm -hmm. in the event that something untoward happens. Do we know, does she like any of these candidates? I've seen a lot of analyses of the electoral maths involved of different choices. Voices, but the person she's got a, a sort of intuitive uh, individual bond with, you'd think would also be a good thing in a partner like that. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Dom. And actually, I've not really seen anybody talk about it from that perspective, that this is somebody you're going to have to work with, presumably for at least four years. And, and you know, you'd, they'd be hoping for, for at least eight. And so that choice is absolutely critical. And I think you're so right to point out the role that Biden played for Obama, because, you know, the other thing was Obama had been a senator, but just didn't have the kind of weight of experience that Biden did in, in wrangling Congress, you know, in yeah. getting legislation through. And that's the role that he played. You know, he was kind of the negotiator and also the like reassuringly white old dude who could talk to the other old white dudes in the Senate and kind of bring them, <laughs> bring them along. He spoke old white dude. He really he did. did. Yeah. Fluently. And, and so does Harris need someone like that, you know, who can wrangle Congress for her the way that, you know, LBJ did for JFK. Like there's a long history of, of that kind of move. So it's, it's yeah, it's a super good point, Dom, because all of the analysis – most of the analysis I've seen is on that kind of shallow, you know, what are her political weaknesses in the eyes of the electorate? How is she going to offset them? And inevitably that means the list of potential candidates thrown up by the media is uh, white men, often kind of from the Midwest. Um, mm. So, so yeah, it will be so interesting to see kind of what her calculation is there. In a moment, how the Republicans are reacting to all of this. And uh, I think not well is the summary. We'll find out more in a second. The Chaser Report. More news, less often. Okay, so among the reactions, Emma, from the GOP to this uh, dramatic change of, of um, Democratic, you know, inevitable nominees at this stage, Donald Trump has accused the Democrats of fraud and said he should get a refund because they spent all this time uh, planning to fight against Biden. They had a whole convention where the theme was that Trump was better than Biden. They made that case. And then three days later, Joe Biden dropped out. Uh, potentially convinced by their arguments. No, not at all. But in fact, um, quite well-timed, as it turned out, in terms mm -hmm. of resting back momentum onto his side of politics. What are some of the responses you've seen from the Republicans and how much do you think they're worried about this complete recalibration of the race? I think, I think Dom, they are pretty worried. You know, you mentioned Trump's response and he does, the, the tantrum kind of seems to be escalating a little bit. You know, initially he didn't go that hard for, for Trump. I have to put that asterisk in, but he does seem to be kind of stamping his feet harder and, and leaning into this kind of facetious argument about it being anti-democratic and Harris being an illegitimate candidate, which of course is a, a tried and true tactic for him. And, you know, there were calls as there always are, you know, initially for Trump and his surrogates in particular to kind of tone down the rhetoric and, and not go after, you know, Harris's identity. But of course they can't resist that, you know, that that's kind of, um, that was something or something Trump was always going to lean into. You know, this is a guy that rose to national political prominence off the back of a racist birther conspiracy about the first black president, you know, who in his eyes and the eyes of so many of his supporters couldn't possibly be a legitimate candidate for the presidency. And you can see that pattern repeating with Harris and the fact that she's a, a woman as well just adds so much more fuel to the fire. And so even his, you know, the lamest of Trump's nicknames, you know, about laughing 
often Kamala Harris is kind of leaning into this like characterization of, you know, women and particularly black women as like cackling witches and the lying as well, you know, this kind of scheming woman image. And they're also really leaning into this narrative around her as a DEI candidate. So a diversity, equity and inclusion candidate, which again is Ooh, designed. That's a bit nasty. It's, it is. It's it, again, shocking, not, not at all surprising given what we know about American politics. And the whole point is to to delegitimize her, you know, that basically nobody but a, a white man could possibly have gotten to the position they're in on merit alone. And, you know, I just think that's worked so well for Trump and the movement behind him until now. There's no reason to think he's not going to keep going down that road. Of course he will. And it has gotten personal. There's been discussed there's been discussion of the fact that she hasn't had children. And in fact, the second gentleman, her husband, has um, spoken in her defense. This is really quite um, ugly stuff. It's it's really ugly, you know, and we've experienced some of that, of course, in Australia as well. So I don't think it comes at all as a surprise. Um, I think the campaign will be would have been ready for it. You know, there's no way that Harris and her team wouldn't have known this was coming. They've already been experiencing it. It's just, you know, kind of ratcheting up to another level, but it is ugly and it's really dangerous. And I think it's especially dangerous given, you know, that we already know that politics in America is incredibly volatile. So it's pretty, it's pretty horrible to watch. And I guess, you know, from our perspective, we can, we can hope that the kind of romance of Harris's candidacy outshines that you know and and Biden spoke about that in his address today you know that kind of love in response to to hate argument hmm. it has gotten personal and a lot of it's been led by JD Vance the, Bryce, the vice presidential candidate and senator from Ohio, who is also very new to national politics. It's been suggested, though, that some within the Trump camp are even regretting their choice now that they're up against Kamala Harris, which is interesting. Donald Trump has denied this, but can we believe that denial? It just shows, I guess, how much this race has transformed, Emma. It, yeah, absolutely. I just, like, it's so funny, Dom, that, you know, <laughs> a few days a few days later, the, the rumours are that they're regret, regretting J.D. Vance's, um, the pick of, of J.D. Vance. You know, he was kind of spun as this um, incredible speaker, a charismatic speaker, and he is, you know, I, I've seen him, but has since kind of on the stumps said some pretty weird things and maybe hasn't been as deferential to Trump as he perhaps should have been, um, and we know how Trump feels about that. So, you know, it's <laughs> it's not surprising, I think, that things are getting shaky. And, of course, there's also been all of that emphasis on, you know, what Vance said about Trump before he had his kind of miraculous conversion. And um, while they, you know, I would expect would have anticipated that when they made the choice, that probably doesn't change the fact that when it's actually happening, it would be supremely irritating to Trump. And you put that on, alongside the kind of early success of, of Harris, and you can totally see why he would both want to direct blame it at Vance and also, you know, potentially jettison him. So we've gone from uh, a rehash that almost nobody wanted who a historic race really uh the first ever uh woman of color to be a major party candidate and only the second in history as someone who has to talk about this stuff um almost every day on tv emma are you more excited about covering the race now that the change has been made are, are you sharing whether you know not necessarily saying you endorse one side over the other but just the fact that we're talking about somebody relatively new rather than biden v trump chapter a million mm. It's totally energizing, John. Like I have no problem a- admitting that because you know I I think every or lots of people who watch American politics had fallen into that real kind of despair about the race, but also what you know what's at stake. Like you know Biden's not wrong to say that this is a battle for the soul of America, and and especially as someone who who watches Trump and the kind of policies beneath him really closely, like it is genuinely really concerning the threat that he poses to American democratic institutions. Like that has huge implications for the United States and for us as well. So to see that kind of injection of energy into the race and a, and also I think a genuine choice for Americans is, um it is exciting and it, it certainly makes it more interesting and less kind of pit of despair stuff. It's pit of despair is still there, but it feels like at least for the last couple of days, we've been able to crawl out of it. I mean, come on, Emma, he's supporting to only try to overthrow American democracy that one time. I know, sorry, it's so dramatic. Time. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, it does make me wonder, though, if he does lose this election, 
uh, there'll be quite the explosion and it, it mm. could be a scary day. I, I think I'm not going to want to be in uh, in the US in November, even if anyone asks me to be for election day, because who knows what will happen? Yeah, look, uh, same, absolutely same. And I, I kind of already thought that before Biden had um, withdrawn, just because of exactly as you've described, the kind of volatility and the normalisation of political violence. But when you add to that the, the potential backlash to having a woman of colour elected to the presidency, I think you do have a, a potentially quite scary situation. Like no, nothing is inevitable, of course, but what hasn't changed is the fact that American democracy teeters, really teeters on the brink. Well, I would say the one thing we know for certain is that Donald Trump won't be on the ballot in four years' time. But actually, I can't say that. You no, can't, make can't even say that. <laughs> mm, yeah. Whether, even if he wins the presidency, there's every chance uh, he'll try and find a way to have a, a third term. Who can say? As now the oldest uh, candidate in American history, given that the other one has dropped out. All of this said, Emma, it's just fascinating. I can't look away from it. And thank you for indulging me once again in uh, bringing us up to speed on all that's happening. Time we next speak, I I imagine there'll be two completely different candidates, uh, possibly uh, settling the election in the UFC octagon. I just don't know. I'm hoping it's a confirmation of UFOs. That's my black swan hopeful. Oh, that's the next thing? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully and, we can talk about votes, that next time. How many votes do they get at the DNC? Are they <laughs> super duper delegates? I don't know. We'll find out. All right. Thanks very much for joining us, Emma. <laughs> thanks, Tom. Our gears from Road with part of the Iconoclast Network, and we'll catch you next time.